Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining our Hong Kong Migration Pathways to Australia webinar. My name is Jules Kelly. I'm the Sales and Marketing Manager at SMATS Group. And tonight, I'm extremely proud to introduce our guest speaker, Simon Devere. Simon is the Director of Migration Services at Sterling Henry, who are SMATS Group's strategic partner. And Sterling Henry are a well-respected and established leader in Australian migration with offices throughout Australia and Hong Kong. Simon Devere has a wealth of experience in migration pathways to Australia, having previously worked for the Australian Government Department of Immigration and Border Protection for more than 25 years, based in Australia and also overseas in six other countries. Uh, before we get started, please feel free to submit any questions in the, either the chat room or Q&A room, or you can email me directly and we'll be sure to be in touch with you. So uh, welcome, Simon. Thank you very much. Julie, I hope everybody can hear me. Let me just get started and uh, I'll introduce myself once we get the screen up. Um, I hope people can see that. Jules, can you just let me know yeah. if that's clear? It's all good. Okay, that's great. Well, look, Julie, thank you very much for the welcome this evening and good evening to everybody there in Hong Kong. And I know some other people I think are watching elsewhere in Australia. Um, as Julie said, my name's Simon Devere and I'm the Director of the Migration Services Team at Sterling Henry Global Migration. Um, Sterling Henry uh, works in partnership with SMATS. We have had a great partnership with SMATS for a number of years now and really enjoy working with our SMATS colleagues. Uh, obviously, our priority is supporting SMATS clients with their migration needs. Um, and we're always, of course, happy to do that and have done that for quite a few years now and have really enjoyed that, the opportunity to do that and provide that service. Um, as Julie said, uh, Sterling Henry Global Migration, we have been around now for 30 years. Uh, this, uh, I think next year is our 31st year. We have been supporting individuals and businesses uh, over the whole of that time. Uh, we represent clients ranging from all kinds of companies, from small startups right through to large multinationals, franchises, any number of uh, professional trades uh, and, and uh, fintech and ag tech and various other things. So we hope that what we can provide tonight will give you something of an understanding of Australia's migration program. As we get started, uh, I just wanted to sort of set the scene. Australia has, um, I'm, I'm going to be providing a very high level presentation tonight. I won't be going into a great amount of detail on the individual visa categories because there is so much information and so, so much detail in the law and the policy. So as I was thinking about this presentation and what I thought you may need, it occurred to me that a high level look across the whole of the migration program may be of value to you all. And so we'll do that. And if the opportunity arises in the future for any of you or any of your friends or colleagues to go uh, with us into more detail, on the particular, uh, the particular requirements of the visas. Well, of course, we can always do that, you know, at another opportunity. So just to let you know tonight, we won't be going into a huge amount of detail. We'll keep it high level uh, and that we hope will be of value to you. Um, that's me, as Julie said, 25 years in the Department of Immigration. I served in Canberra, in uh, Cambodia, Bangkok, South Africa, Sri Lanka, and Vietnam. My last job overseas was the head of our migration team based in China, um, where I was also managing the Hong Kong team. So I know, uh, I know Hong Kong well. So, all right. Well, without further ado, let's get started. Uh, in a nutshell, Australia has got three broad categories of visas, and I'm sure many of you will know these now. Permanent entry visas, temporary visas for work and study, and visitor visas for business and holidays. And tonight we'll probably almost entirely focus on the first of those categories, which is permanent entry 
and residency. And we'll talk briefly about temporary visas as well for work and study. So what can we say about permanent migration to Australia? Basically, a permanent migration visa, as you would all understand, I'm sure, is that visa that allows you to stay in Australia indefinitely. It doesn't force you to remain in Australia. People with permanent resident visas move backwards and forwards from overseas all the time. But every time they enter Australia, they enter as a permanent resident with all the privileges of being a permanent resident and you can stay essentially in Australia indefinitely. The five categories of permanent residency are on the screen in front of you. The first one is the skilled migration program, the uh, employer nomination program, sorry, I'll, I'll back up. The skilled migration program is exactly what it says. It is a program for highly skilled individuals who are seeking to enter Australia based on their skills. And we'll talk about that in detail in a moment. The employer nomination program, the second of those five categories, is for employees of Australian businesses. Now they're businesses that are in Australia, but that visa program is also open to businesses who are overseas and who are looking to set up in Australia. So for example, a Hong Kong, uh, a fintech business in Hong Kong could apply to become a sponsor and could sponsor one or more employees to move to Australia to set up their business in Australia. Um, so that's, as it says, it's for employers looking to sponsor their employees. The next category, which is a very important category and an increasingly important category, is the state and territory nomination program. And this is for people who are highly skilled and whose skills are in demand in one or other of the state government, uh, in one of the states or territories of Australia. So an example of that may be a person who is a, um, let me think, uh, physiotherapist, Physiotherapists are certainly in demand in Queensland and in Western Australia, always in demand in the Northern Territory. And so people can actually be nominated by the state government and the state government will assist that person to obtain a perm either a long-term temporary visa or a permanent resident visa. So unlike the employer program where a person must have a business and an employer, the state government will sponsor the person and they enter Australia, not to take up a particular job, but to relocate to that state. The next category is one that I think many of you will be familiar with, and that's the business and investor stream program. It's for the high net worth individuals uh, and, and people who are able to invest significant funds in Australia. We'll talk about the details later. Uh, and also for business owners. So those who have been owning their own business or have been in a partnership and will bring their business skills to Australia. Many of you may remember the old program, which was called the Business Skills Program or the BSP. And that was, has been very popular for many years. That has changed over the years and it's increasingly now a business owner and investor visa program. And we'll go into details as we go forward. And finally, the migration program, the family migration program. And that's for, I've said they're spouses of Australian citizens. It's also for the children of Australian citizens as well. Anybody who's in a close family, parents of Australian citizens, children of Australian citizens, and of course, spouses or partners of Australian citizens and permanent residents. And people who, are Australian citizens and permanent residents living overseas, if they are thinking of returning to Australia, they can sponsor their spouse and children to go back with them. What we're gonna do now is we're going to go into each of these categories one by one and just go into a little bit more detail uh, 
in, in, in thinking that this will obviously we hope will be of assistance to you so the skilled migration visa program the first of those five that we spoke about previously as i said this visa is for highly skilled individuals who have occupations that are in demand and who want to live and work anywhere in australia without a sponsor or a nominator so these are not people who are employed by Australian business and they are not people who are sponsored by a state or territory and they are not a high net worth individual. They are a person who is simply highly skilled in a highly in demand occupation. And the usual criteria, the four key criteria are their occupation must be on the long term list of skilled occupations. So the occupation have been declared by the Australian government to be in demand. They must meet the points test. Many of you will understand the points test that lists a range of employability factors. They must be under 45 years old and they must lodge an expression of interest and then be invited to apply. So it's a very common, it's a very well understood visa and it is for those who don't have a sponsor but do have skills in demand. And if anyone who's listening tonight thinks that they may uh, be uh, eligible for this visa, obviously we'd be very happy to talk to you and go through what the requirements are. The next of the two categories of visa, of visa programs is a really important one. It's the employer nomination visa. And as I said earlier, it is for people who are uh, going to be sponsored by their Australian employer. Australian employers, those who have businesses in Australia and those who may have an office overseas in Hong Kong or in Singapore, anywhere in the world, can sponsor their employees to come to Australia as a permanent resident. There are two streams, so two subcategories of visa. The direct entry visa and the temporary residence transition visa. And in both cases, the occupation must be in demand. Again, it must be on the long-term skilled list. For the direct entry or the DE stream, a nominee must also have a positive skills assessment. And what that means is that they're skills have been assessed by the appropriate Australian authority as being equivalent to the Australian standard. For the other stream, the temporary residence transition stream, the, the nominee must have worked for the sponsor in Australia for at least three years. So usually in that situation, a person would enter Australia on a long-term temporary visa, say a four-year temporary visa, and then after three years, they would apply for permanent residency. And that's a very popular program. People are employed by an Australian employer, they have a job, and they yes, they are on a temporary visa. However, at the end of three years, if all is going well and they're still working for their employer, then they can be sponsored for a permanent resident visa. It does take obviously longer to get a temporary residence transition visa, obviously three years longer, but the person who comes to Australia on the temporary visa and works can be confident that at the end of the three years, if things are going well, they can be sponsored by their employer. And at Sterling Henry Global Migration, we have done literally thousands of these visas over the last 30 years. It's extremely popular visa. Employers like it because their employee is happy and settled for three or four years. And the employees are happy because they know that if they continue to work for their employer, then at the end of three years or three and a half years, then they can apply for PR or permanent residency. The age limit is 45, however. So it is important that uh, if people are interested in this visa, that they factor in the 45 year cutoff. Because what sometimes happens is people 
they're in their mid career, they're in their thirties, maybe even their late thirties. They're thinking about moving to Australia on a temporary visa and they, for whatever reason, they postpone traveling and then they get to 41 or 42 and they run out of time to apply for the visa uh, before they turn 45. So while it is a popular visa, uh, like most permanent resident visas, it's most popular amongst young people, early mid career people who are keen to have a long term pathway to Australia. And of course, they must have English and meet character and health, the usual requirements for a permanent resident visa. The next visa category that we are speaking of is the state and territory nominated visas. Now, to give you some background, state and territory nominated visas have not been a big feature of the Australian Migration Programme. Uh, traditionally, most people came in on an employer nominated visa or a skilled independent visa. But over the last five to 10 years, and particularly in the last year or so, the state and territory nominated visas have really become an, a very important part of the skilled migration program because they give the state and territory governments, so we're talking, as you would probably know, Western Australia, South Australia, Tasmania, Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, the Northern Territory, and the Australian Capital Territory, they give those governments an opportunity to attract skilled people to come and live and work in their state or territory on a skilled visa where the state is able to choose the occupations that they have in demand. So you'll remember that on the other visas, the ones we've spoke about previously, we talked about the long-term skilled occupation visas. Well, the same thing applies for state and territory nominated visas, but the states and territories have their own lists. So if you were to put up on your computer, the skilled occupation list for New South Wales, next to the skilled occupation list, let's say for, Western Australia, those lists will have some similarities, but they'll also have some differences. And the same applies to every state and territory. So very often when people say to us here at Stirling Henry, oh, I'd like to think about migrating to Queensland because I have a friend there or an auntie or a cousin, my brother might live there. Can I get a visa to go to Queensland? Well, the answer to that is, well, it depends if your occupation is on the Queensland list of skilled occupations. And if it is, well, then we can, obviously, the, the, there may be some possibility for eligibility. But there are situations where a person may not be eligible to go to Queensland because their occupation is not on the Queensland list, but they may well be eligible on the Western Australian list or the New South Wales list. And so our clients look to say, well, mm, OK, I'll have to think about that. Other, other requirements that I've listed here, apart from the most important one where the occupation must be on the state's territory list of skilled occupations, the other requirements are there are, the, there are other eligibility criteria. For example, teachers, just excuse me, teachers who are looking to go to be nominated for Victoria, they want to come and teach in live in Melbourne, teach in Melbourne, that's fine. Teachers are, particularly senior school teachers are on the list for Melbourne, how, uh, for Victoria. However, Victoria has a very, very detailed list of employability criteria that apply to teachers. They don't want, for example, the government doesn't want all teachers to come. They just want, I think, science, maths, STEM subjects, languages, and they also require a very high level of English, much higher than the normal level of English, um, which might be say, um, you know, a mid-level level of English. For those who are going to be teaching in Victoria, they, the, the, the um, government requires them to have a higher level of English. The nominee must have a positive skills assessment. Again, they must go off and have a, a skills assessment. 
The age limit again is 45. However, in some cases, the state government will allow a person who is over the age of 45 to apply for their, for their nominated visa. And they would be people, for example, with very high levels of skill in very, very specialized uh, occupations. For example, medical occupations. Most states and territories would be happy for a person who was a, um, a medical specialist to be over the age of 45, maybe not over the age of 55, but over the age of 45, because they see that some of those people who are over, while they are over 45, they have a very high level of skills and, they, and the state government would like to attract them. And of course, meet the character and the, uh, must meet English and meet the character requirements. So a very, a very common and very popular visa and increasingly so, and uh, really over the last, as I said, the last four to five years, we have seen a larger number of these visas being granted as states and territories have sought to attract highly skilled people to their, to their, uh, to their uh, jurisdiction. Um, next, the business innovation visas. Those of you who have studied Australian migration for maybe for many years will remember the old business skilled visas. Um, these visas are for business owners and high net worth individuals. For business owners, the applicant must demonstrate significant business ownership over several years and have, of course, significant business and personal assets to transfer to Australia. And for those who are interested in the investor visa, what some people call the golden ticket visa, these are well, well understood in the media. They are for people who have, for example, either 5 million for the significant investor visa or 10 million for the higher level um, visa, I can't remember what it is now, um, uh, to be able to invest in approved investments in Australia. This is a very complicated part of the visa program. The requirements are extremely complex. And uh, if you are interested in a, either a business innovation or a business owner visa or business investor visa, you know, we would encourage you to seek, uh, seek good advice because uh, the regulations are, are complex and, and uh, hard to understand at times. And of course they will frequently change. So before you go into a pathway, which is leading you towards a, uh, one of these visas, like all visas, we would encourage you to seek further advice. The next category, well, we're now moving into the temporary visas. Um, the temporary, the, the key temporary visas for many young people are of course the student visas and the training visas. And there are a number of different student and training visas, which can be extended into the long-term work visas, temporary work visas, and then into the PR program. But as I've said in the note here, PR is only available if the study and the employment is in an occupation that is listed on the long-term skills list. So it does require careful planning. If you are thinking that you will study in Australia, followed by a temporary visa, followed by PR, well, the lead times, as I've said in my slide, are extremely long. They may stretch out to four to six or even more years to get to PR. And of course, oh, I've got some typos there, I apologize. There is a risk that the occupation lists will change. So what has happened in the past is that some people have come to Australia having been told that their student visa will give them an occupation which will give them PR. And in the middle of that process, the, the skilled occupation list will cha changes and they lose the opportunity that they had to remain in Australia. So it is important if you are thinking about a long-term plan or if you have friends or relatives who are thinking about a long-term plan to give it some very careful thought. The last dot point there is that it is just an example of a pathway, a very common pathway for many young people coming to Australia. 
obviously pre-COVID, is that they start off on their student visa, then they move to a post-study work visa for two years. That's the visa that's available to Australian university graduates. They can work in Australia for two years. That then gives the person an opportunity to move to a temporary skill shortage visa, which is a temporary working visa for up to four years. And then they may be eligible for the employer nomination or the state sponsored or even the independent permanent resident visa. So a very, a very common pathway is student visa, post-study work visa, temporary skill shortage visa, and followed eventually by employer nomination. And we see many cases like this every year where the person has studied in Australia, has worked in Australia, has developed a good relationship with an employer and they're able to get PR. It's a long pathway, but it's a very well understood pathway and it works very well. As long as the employment, the career, the occupation is in one of the occupations that is on the long term list. So we've talked about permanent residency, we've talked about studies and training. And in closing, it is worth just noting that there are a number of other visa pathways that we haven't spoken about tonight, just because of the lack of time that we have tonight. And they are these in no particular order. I spoke earlier about the temporary skill shortage visa. This is a sponsored visa for up to four years, which can then lead to PR after three years. So a person who wants that visa or is looking for that visa must have a sponsor and they can be granted a four year visa. They can also be granted a two year visa. So that's a complex program because of the occupation requirements of that visa. The next one, the skilled regional visa. This is a new visa, which has only been going now for, well, not even a year. It's uh, a visa for a person, a highly skilled person who wishes to work in one of the regional locations in Australia. And the visa is designed to encourage people to move away from Sydney and Melbourne and, and Brisbane, the big three population centers on the East Coast, and think about working and studying in a regional location. And if you think that a regional location means only working in a country town, well, that's not true, not correct, because in fact, all of Western Australia, including Perth, has been classified as a regional area, as has South Australia, including Adelaide, Tasmania, including Hobart, and the Northern Territory, including Darwin. So we have a client at the moment who is working for a business in Adelaide and she has been able to uh, or will be shortly applying for the skilled regional visa, even though Adelaide is a very, very busy, large city. Um, so it, it has been classified as a regional city in order to attract people. That's a popular one. It's a five year visa, which then becomes a permanent resident visa after four years as long as the person is still living in the regional area at the end of those four years. The other visas are uh, understood, I think, the working holiday visa for people under the age of 30. Going back a screen, the working holiday visa, I might just go back a screen if I might, Julie. This pathway here, the common pathway at the bottom, which has student visa, postgraduate work visa, temporary skill shortage visa, and then employer nominated visa, the same pathway can apply to the working holiday visa where a person, and even the next one, which is the graduate work visa, where a person can come to Australia, work for two or three years, and then get a relationship going with an Australian employer and be eligible to apply for PR after a, after a period of time. So both those two visas, the working holiday visa and the graduate work visa, do have pathways to permanent residency after three or four years. And finally, uh, I've only spoken very briefly, haven't really spoken about the family migration program, but I have been asked to include mention about the sponsored parent visas. There are uh, three different options for parents of Australian citizens and permanent residents. 
they are the sponsored parent visitor visa for those parents who want to come and live in Australia for three or five years. The long stay temporary visa, the permanent uh, parent visa and the permanent resident parent visa. So the, uh, I could, I, I'm sure I could think of other pathways. They are probably the most common that we deal with here, which have pathways to permanent residency. Each of those, each of those visas on this, on this slide, while they are not in themselves permanent resident visas, do provide a pathway to permanent residency. And I think, Julie, that is probably it for my. Oh, where's that going? Wasn't expecting that. <laughs> someone has put a. Um, someone has put an animation, an animation on it <laughs> in my, into my slide. Um, and there I am. So look, that's a very fast half hour uh, overview of the Australian Migration and Visa Program. It, of course, in no way goes into the detail that many of you might be interested in, but I hope that it's a start for you. I hope that it gives you some ideas, maybe prompts some questions, makes you think about it a little bit more. And I hope perhaps in time, um, in partnership with SMATS that we might be able to assist you further. And Jules, I might leave it there if that's okay. Absolutely, thank you so much, Simon. Um, obviously it's an extremely complex um, process and you really have to understand which visa pathway um, specifically suits your circumstances. So thanks for a really in-depth and interesting presentation. Um, to any of our guests that are interested, um, Simon has kindly uh, offered an initial no obligation uh, free uh, consultation. So um, if you're interested in taking that up, you can either email me at julie at smats.net, S-M-A-T-S.net, or you can send your inquiries through to www.smats.net slash inquiries, um, and we'll happily put you in touch with Simon. Um, thank you so much for everyone to join us. Thank you again, Simon. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, and just thank wish you. everybody a wonderful evening. So thank, thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. All the best, everyone. Thank you so much.